Now, last week we, that, of course, Brother Douglas started us with the light of the world. And last week I continue in that realm. And we share that Jesus says that you are the light of the world. Amen? Now put your hands on your chest and say to yourself, I am the light of the world. Say it again. The light of the world. Don't forget that. We also found out last week that the origin of light is God. The Bible says that God is light. He doesn't have light. He is the embodiment or the epitome of light. And Jesus tells us in John 8, 12, he says that when he was on earth as the historical Jesus, you know, the Jesus who walked on earth, we call him the historical Jesus. Now we are dealing with the resurrected Jesus who can walk through walls. But the historical Jesus didn't walk through walls. He was tired, he, he wept, he ate, but the resurrected Jesus doesn't do that. Amen? But when the historical Jesus was on earth, he says that I am the light of the world. Now, he turns around and tells his disciples, now you are the light of the world. So God is the light. Jesus says that I am the light. Now he's saying that you and I are the light of the world. So true light is Christ likeness. Will you agree with me? And so as light of God, we are, we are to radiate and reflect the light of God, which is the nature of God, the characteristics of God, and the attitude of God here on planet Earth. Amen, somebody? Okay. One thing about light is that light reveals things. If you lost your keys and you can't find it in the dark, what do you do? You switch the light on, and if you are like me, we lost our key. Was it off? I couldn't remember what day it was. We found it anyway. We found it anyway. Amen? And so light reveals things. And as the light of the world, you and I will reveal the, the will of God, will reveal the ways of God, will reveal the nature of God to the people here on earth. Amen? And amen. Light also wins over darkness. The Bible says that the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness cannot comprehend it. Amen? So, the more intense the light, the less the darkness. So, how can we shine? We said last week that first of all, we are to walk in the light of the knowledge of God that you know. So, when you read the scriptures, when you hear the word of God as I'm doing that, you got to practice it and become a Christian practitioner. Say with me, I am a Christian practitioner. Amen. So we are to walk in the light of the knowledge of God that you know. Number two, to, for your light to shine, you have to walk by faith. Say with me, walk by faith. The scripture says that the just shall live by, by faith. Number three, we are to walk in the spirit. Say with me, walk in the Say it again. Not by your feelings. Not by your emotions. But be led and controlled by the Spirit. And when you do that, your light will shine to the people in the world. And number five, we are to walk in wisdom. Say with me. Walk in wisdom. That means that wisdom is the application of knowledge. So when I apply the word of God, the reality of the word of God is seen in and through me. That means that I'm walking in wisdom. Amen? So Jesus says that let, somebody says let, is a command. Let your light so shine before men or women, generic, that they may see tangible, visible, your good works. Let your light so shine before men. Don't hide it. But let it shine before men that they may see your good work and do what? And glorify your Father in where? Heaven. So ladies and gentlemen, God is hiding in the world. And our task is to let the divine emerge through us. Amen? And amen. Well, today... I'm going to be talking about another one of the similitude. Similitude, you know, there's a difference between the beatitude, what your attitude should be, 
and the similitude, what your attitude should be like. Amen. So we're going to deal with salt. Huh? Salty Christians. Salty Christians. So I brought some salt here, just in case you are actually wondering. Huh? Crystal salt. So turn your Bibles, please, to Matthew chapter 5 and verse 13. Salty Christians are we, or should be. Salty Christians. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 13. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 13. Are you there? Can we put it on the board if we can? Please. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 13. And these words came from Jesus. It is a statement made by our Lord Jesus Christ. And look at what it says. Let's read it together, please. You are the salt of the earth. But. Now what is but? A contradiction is coming. You are, but, a contradiction to the previous statement. Look at what the but is. But, if the salt loses its flavor, if, it's a conditional statement. If, maybe it will, maybe it won't. But if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing. But, a contradiction coming again. But a contradiction is coming again. But to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by who? And women. By humanity. Amen, somebody. Now, <laughs> the text speaks of our function, which stems, so our, it speaks of our function here on earth, which stems out of our identity as children of God. But not only that, it also speaks of what happens to us when we fail to play the role that we are expected to play in society by God. So Jesus says that you are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be chosen? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. Now, this is a very heavy uh, statement that Jesus is making. But let's look at what he's saying here. He says that you are the salt of the earth. Not that you may be, not that you may become, but you are the salt of the earth. Attend to someone that says, I am the salt of the earth. I say it again. I am the salt of the earth. Now watch this. The moment you surrendered your life to Christ, the moment you gave your life to him, and you begin to trust and have confidence in him, at that moment, you became the salt of the earth and the light of the world. Amen, somebody. So Jesus is saying that you, as a, you are, as a child of God, what you are as a child of God is reflected in what sort is or is similar to what sort is. You are the salt of the earth. Watch what he didn't say. He didn't say that you are the salt of heaven. Did he say that? Did he say that? No, he says that you are the salt of the earth. Now, what is earth in this text? The earth is the place that you live. And according to Jesus, you are the salt of the place that you live. And the place that you live can be your home. So that means that you are the salt in your home. The place that you live can be your community. It can be your offices. It can be your nation and the world at large. So Jesus is saying that you are the salt in your home. You are the salt in your office. You are the salt in the in your community. You are the salt in your nation. You are. So be the salt. Amen. Are you following me so far? Now, what is salt? Well, according to scientists, salt is produced when two elements come together. That is the element of sodium and chloride. When sodium and chloride come together, salt is produced. Amen? Now, research data tells us that salt is made up of 
60% chloride and 40% sodium. Amen? Question. What is the primary use of salt? What is the purpose of salt? Remember that everything that God made is with a purpose and has a pattern. Say with me. Everything that God makes is with a and it has a pattern. So what is the primary use of salt? Number one, salt is used for seasoning. To some of you who like cooking, you realize that without salt, uh, mm. so salt is used for seasoning. It is used to bring out flavor in food. Is that true? Huh? But I will is that true? You cook a lot, I don't cook. Uh, sorry? Let the jollof rise. That's the only thing I can cook, you know. <laughs> well, don't blame me. My wife just sucked me out of the kitchen. I don't want any poison here. <laughs> I said, okay. I got to take insurance just in case. So salt helps, <laughs> salt helps to get the best taste out of, food, out of food. Much of it would, would rather be tasteless without salt. Is that true? So what Jesus is saying is this. Is that we are the salt of the earth. He's saying that I have deposited something in you to help bring the best out of people, though they may be bad. That I have put something in you to bring the best out of people so they can be what God wants them to be. Amen. He has gifted you with such quality as such to enhance the life of someone, to make somebody a better person, to make people better Christians, to make them better wives, to make them better husbands, to make them better parents. I have deposited something in you to enhance, to bring the flavor out of people's lives. How about that? Good night. In other words, he's saying that you are the salt of the earth to bring the best out of people. They may be bad, but inside them there is something Good in them that we can draw it out. And that's who we are as a salt. Amen. But not only that, as a child of God, you are to bring out flavor in life. Because in the world full of and filled with depression, the child of God should be radiating the joy of the Lord. Amen, somebody. Releasing the excitement of serving the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us that let the weak say I am. Let the weak say I am. Let the poor say I am. The joy of the Lord is my. So as Christians, we are supposed to be releasing joy to the world. And not having, not sitting down and looking like we've been baptized with lemon juice. Amen. So if I go to a place, and there's no joy, there's joy in me. They have to be overflow. To radiate the joy of the Lord. In that place, somebody look at me one day. He says, your face is something that makes people happy. I say, she, you mean I've got a gift? A gift of laughing? Me, Allah, if you come to my home, comedy and I, we are friends. <laughs> I can watch comedy. Day. Don't try that at home. Amen. But folks, in a world buried with hatred and strife and indifference, the child of God should be manifesting the love of God. Amen. In the world filled with anxiety and, 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 and worry and, and, and hopelessness, the child of God should be manifesting confidence and hope in God. Amen. After all, the Bible says that with God, all things are with God, with God, with God, all things are possible. The scripture says that he will do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we think or imagine. So when we are around, when we are around things that are impossible, we ought to manifest the possibility of God. So people will know that there is a God in heaven who is a supernatural God that he overrides the natural. And bring the supernatural on the scene. Be that sort. In the world filled with unfaithfulness. In the home. In the offices sometimes. In relationship. The child of God must 
and shoe be releasing faithfulness. A salt to the world. In the world filled with betrayal, the child of God must and should be demonstrating loyalty at all costs. Amen, somebody. So number one, what does salt does? What does it do? What does it do? Okay, so you put it in the food and it brings the flavor out. So when I come near you, I'm supposed to bring the flavor in you. Ralph, I think I've done that. Number two, salt is not only seasoning, but it also preserves. It's a preservative. In the olden days, before the invention of the refrigeration, guess what they used to do? They used to put salt in certain food. And the purpose is to preserve the food so that the food can last a bit longer. So you put salt in the meat or in the fish to help preserve it for a longer time. Now, what it does is this. It slows, sorry, it slows down and stops the process of corruption and decaying. And it attacks the bacteria that might try to invade the fish or the meat and stop it at its track. So that the fish or the meat can be preserved longer. So what Jesus is saying to you and I is this. That you are the salt of the earth in preserving society in which we live in. To keep it from going bad. To keep it from being rotten. To keep it from being weird. Amen. Our lives as children of God, the ecclesia, the call at once, is to prevent us, the home, the community, the workplace, Whatever you may be, to stop it from further decaying. It's already decayed. To stop it from further doing what? Decaying. Now, you agree with me, as we know it now, that there is decay in our homes. Amen? Domestic violence, long-standing relationship being broken up, gangs, teenage pregnancy. We've seen decay in our community. Morality is going down because truth has fallen down on the streets. But we are called by God to preserve the truth of God's standard and authority in our world. So our job is to hold the truth of the word of God up and to make it fresh. Whether people like it or yes. Amen. You didn't catch that one. That is our job. So we need to preserve the truth about morality. That marriage is between one man and one woman, period. I am preaching on. Amen? We should preserve the truth that premarital sex and extramarital affairs is a destruction to family life. Oh, yes. You know, the man comes and says, I love you, I love you. You are the nice thing since sliced bread. The guy wants something. And as soon as the Jerusalem gate is opened, some of you don't know the uh, Jerusalem gate. I will not interpret it. There will be no interpretation on this one. Amen. You, you have to come to the last family service we had. Then you know what I'm talking about. I mean, and the guy leaves. And look. We need to be telling not only our young women not to get pregnant, but the young men not to also go there too. Most often we tell the young ladies and we leave the men alone. And so the men, when they do that, they, I mean, there's some pride. You know, me, I have arrived. I'm a man now. And then we look at the, uh, the ladies as weird. No. Somebody says no. Amen. So we need to preserve the truth that teenage pregnancy is an assault on the future aspiration of our young girls. We need to preserve the truth that being in the gang is an assault on the future of our children. We need to preserve the truth on that. Not only that, but we need to preserve the truth that husbands love your wives. Wives, wives, submit. Amen. Thank you very much, Rob. Submit to the leadership of your husband. Children, obey your parents. I don't care whether you are 30 years old. Yes. Obey your parents. 
Oh, thank you very much. We need to preserve the truth that there is a heaven and there is a hell. And if you don't make up your mind to go with God, your destination might be zero. We need to preserve the truth of that. We need to preserve the truth that says that it doesn't matter what you look like. It doesn't matter the color of your skin or the funny of your nose like mine. That you are fearfully and wonderfully made for your purpose. I was going to say something, but uh, I will get myself in trouble. <laughs> Is that it? Are you sure? No, I will direct them to you, you know. <laughs> maybe not. Maybe not. <laughs> maybe not. But hey, love yourself. If God had wanted you to be a Chinese, he would have put you in a Chinese womb. But he did it. He put me in an African womb for my purpose. So me, I love myself. <laughs> Amen. And that is the truth that we must project onto our children. We need to project the truth that we are here not for our happiness, but for the glory of God. Amen. So number one, what does so does? It says it. Number two. Number three, salt heals. It heals. Not only does salt says it, not only does it preserve, but salt heals. It has some antiseptic property to down infection and bring healing when it is rubbed into an open wound. Some of you who are from Africa, before modernity, and, and I'm talking about, it's about 25 years back, before modernity, and when, when our parents didn't have money to go to the doctors, when you get the womb, they used to open it up and put a salt in there. It would be an abuse. Hey. She, we've been abused in time past. Ah, they'll put a thing, the thing, you'll be crying, the thing, you'll be pain in you. And he, they say, well, either that one or nothing. <laughs> Amen. So as salt of the world, we bring healing to people by our words of encouragement, by our sympathetic hearts, by our empathetic hearts. We bring comfort to people. We bring forgiveness to people. We bring healing because we are the salt of the earth. Another thing that salt does is that salt irritates. Like I said, we put it in an open wound, it burns, and it irritates. When God's word comes, sometimes it stings people, and it makes people feel uncomfortable. That is okay. Salt purifies. If you put salt on an ice, what happens to the ice? It melts the ice. Amen? Number six, salt penetrates or permeates everything that it comes in contact with. Just a pinch of salt, a pinch of salt, can permeate an entire gallon of water. You take salt and you put it into a big bucket of soup, and it is the soup, it is the salt that influences the soup. It is not the soup that changes the salt, but it is the salt that changes the soup. So what Jesus is saying is this, that I have put you here down on earth, not for you to be influenced by earth, not for you to be driven crazy, by the earth, but I put it here for you to change earth by your witnessing at all costs. Amen. So the assignment from the Lord Jesus Christ is this. Literally, as salt is to food, so are you to the world. As salt is to food, so are you to the world. Because we are supposed to keep the world from decaying. We are supposed to, to keep the world from corruption. We are supposed to season the world with the flavor of the Holy Ghost, mingled with kingdom lifestyle. Amen, somebody? Understand this, that God has anointed you. He has empowered you to bring change in your homes, to bring change in your communities, to bring change in the church. To bring change in the nation. He has called you to take the kingdom lifestyle, the beatitude, and mingle it with the gospel message to your home, to your community, to your offices. We have a huge responsibility. Turn to somebody and say, I am a salt to my world. Now, here's where it gets very interesting. Jesus says that the salt can lose its saltiness. Look at the verse 15 again. If the salt, this, 
loses its saltiness, Jesus asked the question, how then can it be seasoned? How shall it be seasoned again? Is that in your Bible? So Jesus is saying that the salt can lose its saltiness. In other words, the salt can lose its ability to influence. It can lose its ability to preserve. It can lose its ability to flavor. It can lose its ability to heal. The salt can lose its saltiness, according to Jesus. Amen. So here's a question to you and I this morning. Can, can the salt lose its saltiness? Can it lose its taste? Can it lose its preservation power? Can it lose its flavoring power? Can it lose its healing power? Because Jesus says that the salt can lose its saltiness. That's the question. It's a rhetorical question. Chemically, I think it is impossible. It's impossible for salt to lose its saltiness. Because salt maintains its purity. Amen? Would you agree with me? It is impossible. So what on earth is Jesus talking about then? Because Jesus says that the salt can lose its saltiness. And when it does, it is good for nothing. And we are saying that, no, it cannot. Chemically, it cannot. Because salt preserves its purity. So what on earth is Jesus talking about? Are you following my logic? You are. Here's what happens. You know when they are in the olden days, when they mined the salt, salt so is also mined, uh -huh. it comes from a place that is not pure. So you find death in the salt as well. So salt loses its effectiveness when it is mixed with dirt. That's a dirt here. Ralph, can you help me? This is pure salt. You can cook with it, okay? You can bake with it. Sister Angela, baking power is here. <laughs> so this is pure salt. So according to Jesus, salt can lose its taste, and we are saying, no, no, it can't. Here's what happened. When you put dirt and mingled with salt, the salt loses its saltiness because you can't put this in food. You can't do anything with it. The only thing that we can do with this salt is put it on the floor to use it as a, a, a grip. Is that a grip? The ice thing. So people can walk on it. So salt loses its saltiness when it is mixed with dirt. Then it's not pure anymore. Is that true? Another thing that happened to salt is that when salt is diluted, you know you put a, a teaspoon of salt into a, a, big bar, a big bucket of water. It is diluted and you will not taste the salt. It loses its effectiveness. Is that true? Okay, here's the application. When we allow our values and our virtues to be mingled with vice, we lose our saltiness, our effectiveness and our influence. When our faith and our belief become compromised, it diminishes its effectiveness. Amen, somebody? We lose this, our saltiness when we allow our heart to be contaminated with anger, with indifference, with hatred, with discord, with strife, with envy, with jealousy, with idolatry, with grudge matches. We lose this, our effectiveness, our saltiness. It's mixed up with dirt. Therefore, you can't cook with it to bring flavor out of the food. Amen, somebody. Are you following me so far? We lose this, our saltiness when our walk does not match our talk. When we preach one thing and we practice something different, we lose this, our saltiness. It's quiet in this Methodist church. We preach love, but we practice hatred. We preach love for God, but we practice love for self. Amen, somebody? We preach one thing, and we do the other. We lose our saltiness, our ability to influence people by, virtue, by our virtues. The church loses its saltiness when we appoint homosexuals as bishops and lesbians as pastors and Syria adulterers as deacons. The church loses its saltiness. Because they will tell you, how can we follow you when you, are, when, when you are bound to the same thing that we are bound to. 
who loses our saltiness, our ability to influence and to bring change. We loses our saltiness when instead of encouraging people, we we'll become their judges and their critics of those who have not yet arrived of where they should be. Rather than becoming flavor and preserving them, we we'll lose our saltiness when we take on the mantle of being a judge to other people. We we'll lose our because you lose your, your ability to influence them. If you are coming to me to talk to me about how bad I am, and guess what? I ain't gonna listen to you. Tell me how good I can become, and you have my ears. Hey, Mister Buddy, Rafa, you okay with that one? If you come and say that you are bad, you are bad, I say, oh yeah, thank you very much. Have a nice life. But tell me how I can be good. And now you got my attention. I, me, I know I'm bad. You, you, I mean, you don't need to tell me. I know that. But tell me how I can move from here to there. Now I'll listen to you. Amen. So we lose our saltiness when we put others down. We lose our saltiness. Jesus, Paul says something in Galatians 6 verse 1. He says that if a brother or a person is overtaken in any trespass, he says that you who are spiritual, watch the word carefully, you who are spiritual, spiritual, restore such a one in the spirit of gentleness, considering yourself that you also can be tempted. In other words, if you understand of how a person should live like, then ladies and gentlemen, be their example. <laughs> Amen. Be their example. If you know where somebody should go, you who are spiritual, be their example. But this is what happens. We generally find ourselves if someone is not measuring up to where we think they should be, we criticize and condemn and judge them. And when we can't bring change, we're trying to change them. So we criticize them, we judge them, we condemn them. And when we can't bring change to them, we remove ourselves away. Instead of staying and praying and agonizing for the individual or the place, we remove ourselves. What if Jesus has separated himself? The Bible says that he came to his own and his own did not receive him. What about if Jesus has separated himself and said, well, these people are bad, they are weird. No, he did not. He found an avenue to connect with them, even though the thing is weird. And he was able to change them by virtue of praying for them and dying for them. He did not remove himself. He found a way to come among, among them and be a blessing. To those who are in need of saving grace, how about that? You who are spiritual, spiritual. I didn't say the person who's in the flesh. The spiritual person will do anything and everything to make sure that the name of God is honored. Amen. Now, I'm, I'm nearly there now. So what happens to the salt when it loses its saltiness? Three things happen according to Jesus. Look at the text. Jesus says that, number one, it is good for Nothing. That's a powerful word. When the salt loses its saltiness, according to Jesus, number one, it is good for. Number two, what happens to it? And number three, it is trodden underfoot by men. All women. Sister Dora, your men are very loud. Please add the women too. <laughs> Amen. Now, let's look at them one by one and then I'll close. Jesus says that when it loses its saltiness, it is good for nothing. That means that you will not be valued anymore. And people will think that you are sounding like a brass and a clanging cymbal. They know and quote the Bible, but they are good for nothing. They are good for nothing because they bow down to the same thing that we bow down to. That's what the people in the world will tell you. I am bad, and I'm looking for an example. And you are bound to you are bound down to the same thing that I'm bound to. It's like the blind leading the blind, and we all go into the ditch. Ladies and gentlemen, in case you don't know, the people in the world admire us. They admire you. When you are faithful to God, they, are, they admire you. When you are faithful to your spouses, they admire you. When you are faithful to the house of God, they admire you. When you are faithful to your work, they admire you. They will say it, but they are watching you. Believe you me. 
Oh, yes. Oh, yes. They admire us when we are one in unity, when we exercise self-control, when we love one another, when we walk in honesty and truth. They won't say anything, but I can guarantee you that they do admire you because they want to see that living right is possible. And they are looking to you as an example. Amen. So Jesus said that it is good for nothing. The second thing that Jesus said will happen is that it will be thrown out. Folks, when you compromise your faith or you have your faith diluted, people don't want to know. Amen? I, shall I tell you my story? Don't hold it against me. That was in the ancients of days. <laughs> when, when I first came into this country, I went back home for holiday. And I used to hate gambling because my dad was a gambler. And I said, this me, I will not be like you. Help me, Lord. But, but then I went back and the guys were playing cards and they used money. So I, I used to condemn it. But then I sat there long enough. You know, when you see, we see long enough, eh? unconsciously, you are sucked into it. So I thought, okay, five, five cities, it doesn't matter, let me put it in. Then I lost. Okay, let's go to 10. Then I lost. And I was getting and the uh, desire to win my money back got me more deeper into that thing. <laughs> Before I realized it, ladies and gentlemen, I was hooked. Gambling badly. And now I try to tell them that gambling is not good. They say, I'm who I shut up. <laughs> I became good for nothing. I became, I mean, good for nothing but to be thrown out. They didn't want to hear me anymore. You coming to tell us, you, I mean, you. I don't think so. Before then, they did listen. Now I'm bound to the same thing that they are bound to. I was not qualified to be heard. And they shut me down. Amen. Number, ten, number three, Jesus says that the third thing that will happen is that you'll be trampled underfoot by men. They will despise you like it happened to me. Before then, you were their champion. Now, you are a villain. Amen. But what I'm trying to say this morning is this, that everybody wants an example. Everybody wants to see that you are living out what they are struggling with. They want an example to. They want to see that it is, it is possible to live the good life. They want to see it. So here is the challenge for us from Jesus. That Jesus is giving the church ultimatum. And he's saying this. Do your job, become a sword, or society will crush you and you'll be falling under the, human, under the, the death of humanity. Do your job as a sword. Amen. Or you'll be crushed under fallen humanity. So ladies and gentlemen, my encouragement to you and to me is this. Be a sort when you are at home. Be a sort when you are in the office. Be a sort when you are in the business world. Be a sort when you are in the academic world. Be a sort when you are in the political world. Be a sort when you are in the governmental world. Be a sort when you are in the media world. Be a sort in wherever you might find yourself in, in the social world. So decide today that I am going to be a salty Christian. That I would like to be someone who preserves, who flavors, who heals, and do all these nice things in my generation by the will of God. Amen. I am a salty Christian. Let's turn to our feet. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah.